You're listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos, and you are listening to Tarazi Tuesdays with the Bible as Literature podcast. This week, Father Paul continues his discussion of Genesis chapter 7, highlighting the difference between soul and spirit in the original Hebrew. Even for English speakers familiar with the distinction between these terms without a solid grounding in the actual text of Genesis, we are bound, Father Paul explains, to conflate their meaning. I am happy to introduce Father Paul on the Bible as Literature podcast, Tarazi Tuesdays. And then, in verse 11, we have a reference to the 600th year of Noah's life. Okay, he is still living. Notice, it's not functional in the separation as before and after. Actually, the fact the before and after is the flood, we're going to encounter later when we would hear that after the flood, Noah lived so many years in chapter 9 later. So just for my hearer to realize that I'm not making this up, it's just I'm taking all my info from the text. And then we have all the fountains of the great deep broken up, the same deep that we had in Genesis 1. And then the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. You know, 40 is a total number, more powerful technically than 100, because it's the result of multiplying 4, which is the 4 direction universal, with 10, which is a total number. You know, 10 is a total number, 100 is a total number, 1,000 total number. But 40 is the shortest to combine a 10 with a 4. And then on that day, Let's listen to it. Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife. Sons are mentioned before the wife because they are going to be the heads of the nations. But Noah's wife is important. But again, she's not as important as the three wives of his sons. So she's there just respectfully so Noah would have his companion like all the other animals and his sons. <laughs> so it's a little bit of a side joke, I would call it, you know, but that's the way it is written. And now we have the three names, very important, and the three wives of the son. Plus, they and every beast after its kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing upon them, and every fowl, and every bird of every sort. Notice the repetition, which would be the original Hebrew, kol, kol, every, all. And they went into Noah and to the ark. So notice this totality. It's like a flock, like when a shepherd Moves, he moves with the entire family, if you like. Whether he says the flock only, it's enough because you hear and understand that he took with the flock also his family and his possession. Notice in Genesis later, we shall hear about the fathers, especially Abraham, taking the flock you know, sheep, camels, and so on, and his possessions, Rakush. That's the understanding, everything. And all this is technically into the ark, which last time, remember, I mentioned, is the Teba. It's not the Aron. It's the basket, the same word that shall be found later in the story of Moses, that is very important for the people to understand. In English, the connection is totally destroyed. And they went in 
unto Noah into the ark. Very interesting that they go with Noah always. And then you have two and two of all flesh. And here, besides the Shanaim, Shanaim, Mikol Habbasar, all the flesh. Basar is flesh. Flesh, technically, it's the meat of the animal and the human being. We are flesh in this sense. And when you say, until now, we have it in Arabic, for instance, the translation of the Nicene Creed, where we have in the original, for us men, anthropy, human beings. In Arabic, we know that's the meaning. It's Nahnu al-Bashar, we the Basar. So this point is very interesting for those who know Arabic. But then we have the addition, Asher Bo, which in it, Ruach Hayim, the spirit that comes from God and of life. Very interesting, which means that it is God that gives life to every Basar. Basar is not living per se. Nice expression in English. You're dead meat. <laughs> it's nice to eat, but it is not living. And then later in chapter 22, I'm going to make this jump because it's interesting that the other rendering, it's not that the human being becomes spirit. You've heard me so many times critiquing the equation between spirit and soul or breath, that's deadly, but that we do in theology. I mean, if you hear our funeral services, there is jump back and forth. I mean, and you could see from the uh, questions that the people ask you, you know, the soul, the spirit, where does my spirit go after I die or whether my soul, I mean, it's the same understanding. But in verse 22, let me jump to it. It's very important because we have all in whose nostrils, very interesting, we have nose in the plural, was the breath of life. Nishmat Ruach Hayim. Notice here we have Ruach Hayim. Later in 22, it's the breeze of the spirit of life, which brings us back to chapter 2, where God breathed in Adam, and he becomes a breath. Let's go to the Psalms, in the Septuagint, where we have Pasapnoi, Pnoi is the breathing from Pnevma, and notice in our English, we hear let every breath Praise the Lord. And that is the nasmat, which again is used in Arabic to refer to human beings. Again, some of my readers might say, we knew that already, but the problem is that they knew it with their mind that combines as one reality, the soul and the spirit. And that is not allowed in verse 22, because we have the Ruach Hayim, but it is reflected as a breath or breeze in the nostrils. I mean, you cannot be more specific than that. You breathe in the nostrils. This is like our mouth to mouth, you know, you have to bring the breathing inside. But Ultimately, the life comes from God, and we are reminded with that famous tree of life that man was not supposed to eat after he contravened God's command. Let's go back to 1516. In 16, we have again, Zakar Unakaba of all Basar. Very important combination of these words together. 
Zakar Unakaba of Ol Basar. And then one more time, Noah went in taking with him all living beings as God had commanded him. Okay, that's three times in this small passage. And then the Lord shut him in. Very interesting. I like to point to that part where it is God who is shown through what you hear to the hearer that he did the action of closing. Very interesting. It is as though the author is acting out his original statement that everything happens at the command of God. So very interesting, this statement at the end of verse 16. And the flood was for 40 days. Let's move ahead. 18, we have the verb prevailed and the waters prevailed. 19, and the waters prevailed exceedingly. And then in 20, waters prevail. That prevail in the original is gabar from the same root as gibor, became mighty, grew. Again, for the hearing, it's very important. They became so powerful. And notice the cadence in 18, 19, 20. It is as though you're hearing and through it seeing how the waters were getting up and covering everything. Later, we shall hear how they covered all the mountains, including Mount Ararat, but you have it already at the end of 20, and the mountains were covered. Mountains, the peaks, the highest possible. In other words, you would not see the earth anymore. Okay? So, it's a very interesting literary device. Three times prevailed, prevailed, prevailed. And Gibor already prepares you for the might of the waters. Earlier we found Nimrod as Gibor and so on. But in Ezekiel we realize that he has another word, Geut, the arrogance of men, mountains, temples, powerful people is not good. It is only the Geut, the arrogance of God that is befitting. He is alone the Gibor of Israel. So, this is what we have here. And then 21, you can hear it. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both fowl, cattle, beast, and so on. But interestingly, at the end, so that you would get the punch against the reader and every man Ha-Adam. Very interesting. So we have all flesh, and then you have the mention of all kinds of living beings, but specifically at the end, the human being is mentioned under his central name that appeared first in Genesis 1, Ha-Adam. And this brings back to Mind that God will erase Adam from the face of the Adama. Very important. Then 22, where we have the mention, which I commented on before, that it is the breath of the spirit of life. And then an interesting word at the end, the reference to the dry land is in the Hebrew Horoba, very interesting. Earlier in chapter 1, we had Yobasha from Yabash, but here we have one of the words that is used to speak of the desert, but more specifically the rubble. Those who know about archaeology in the Middle East, you have names of very 
many places. Khirbet something. Kharab means the destruction, the rubble. Okay, so here we have, obviously the author means the dried land, but it is destroyed. You see, this is where the original is really, even if the importance is secondary, still it's interesting to notice what the author is doing. So it's not that it was dry as when it came out of the waters in chapter 1. No, there is something different here. It is destruction. It's not the first step to building as in Genesis, but it's destruction. And I know this because of the origin. Otherwise, you know, you would hear just dry land and you refer to the previous dry land. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.